This tape is edited from the Vanderbilt Television Archives. The image of Ireland in times of crisis consists of three case studies of newsworthy events carried on U.S. television from 1969 to 1981. The first study by Joseph and Beverly O'Rourke of Wabash College is of the riots in 1969. Americans were aware of trouble between the Catholics and the Protestants from the occasional news stories of civil rights clashes in 68 and 69. Repeated outbreaks of violence in the first weeks of summer suggested that should a confrontation take place, there was a strong possibility of riot or civil war. We will address four questions in this study. What is the image? Is the image accurate? Is the reporting politically biased? is the image slanted. All three networks projected an image of Belfast and Derry. ABC chose to show the aftermath with commentary by its correspondent, Bill Butel. But CBS and NBC selected chaos with Belfast and Derry burning. Government officials are meeting in urgent session again to deal with the rioting. A report by satellite now from Bill Butel in Belfast, Northern Ireland. Today the windows are boarded up, the streets are cleaned more or less, and Belfast is doing what it can to go on with business as usual. You can't predict whether there'll be more violence tonight or tomorrow or not till this weekend when there are enough people around with the leisure to become a mob. You can predict, however, that the violence will continue. So in Northern Ireland, government leaders are considering a ban on all public meetings and demonstrations in an effort to halt a new outbreak of religious riots. More than 100 persons have been injured in Belfast since the weekend. And we have a report from CBS Newsman Bob Simon. For the third consecutive night, Belfast was under siege. The city where religion is politics was subject to the worst clashes between Catholics and Protestants in over 30 years. Special police forces summoned from all over Northern Ireland tried to keep the warring factions apart and were in turn attacked by both sides. Here they occupy a small no man's land between a poor Catholic street and a poor Protestant street. In Belfast, Northern Ireland, rival gangs of Catholics and Protestants threatening to burn houses and destroy the city are roaming the streets. Members of both religions have fled, looking for some place safe from the rioting. August 12th was the anniversary of the Apprentice Boys' defense of Derry under the siege of the Catholic armies of James II in 1689. The event is celebrated with a parade of the Orange Lodges through the streets of Derry and Belfast, the members taunting the people of the Catholic neighborhoods. Well, the parade was peaceful until young Catholics attacked the Protestants. The police in their uniforms are patient, enduring the attacks and separating the two sides. You will note the cameraman couldn't seem to find Protestant rock throwers. And the police feel perfectly secure with the Protestants behind them. We're marching to war. past the square called Waterloo Place, the Catholics, from the Londonderry slum called Bogside, began throwing rocks. For nearly an hour and a half, the police ducked a barrage of rocks, stones, and bricks. Then, with the familiar cry of, we shall not be moved, the Catholic mob pressed its luck. Now the police, after incredible patience, moved to break up the rioters. There was a baton charge. This was followed by an advance of armored jeeps and armored cars. The Catholics countered with Molotov cocktails. And for nearly an hour, a narrow street in Londonderry became a blackened battleground. The casualties mounted. In the faces of both sides, there was a look of hate and in their hands, the prospect of further destruction. As over 10,000 Protestants began the procession, special police patrols waited apprehensively. For the city's one and only annual tourist attraction, shops were boarded up and closed down. For weeks, violence was feared. At first, it looked as if the anxiety had been unjustified. 
The orange men paraded up and down the city streets with their bagpipes and their banners, and there wasn't the slightest hint of Catholic resistance. Then, just as the celebration was coming to an end, an ominous barricade went up on the Catholic side of the walls. Catholics on one side, Protestants on the other, the predominantly Protestant police force in the middle. Rocks, bottles, and paving stones flew in every direction. The first casualty, a journalist hit in the head with a brick. Bernadette Devlin, radical young member of parliament, urged the Catholics to evacuate their women and children so they could fight without impediment. If you want to stay out, at least take the girl behind the barricade. Will you not just let your stop here, sweetheart? As night fell, the firebombs began. One after the other, they crashed on the pavement and lit up the dark, narrow streets. By early morning, almost 100 policemen injured, the number of civilian casualties impossible to determine. All you could see were flaming barricades in a hazy distance. A water tank managed to keep the first fires under control, but it couldn't get close enough to turn its hoses on the mob. Finally, word came from Belfast. The police could use tear gas. For the first time in Northern Ireland's history, tear gas was used to disperse a crowd. Until dawn, a stalemate. But the Molotov cocktails had taken their toll. Fires blazed out of control throughout the Catholic area. Here, a granary and a bakery burning to the ground. This was hardly the first night of religious violence in Londonderry's history, and no one expects it to be the last. The question in everybody's mind is whether the fires lit here will ignite the entire country. Bob Simon, CBS News, Londonderry. The army was called in, but the riot continued with young Catholics having the time of their lives. Note the repeated emphasis by picture and commentary of young people out of control and enjoying the mayhem they have created. Oxide, the explosive stronghold of the Catholics, in effect surrounding the area. Some of the soldiers are even posted on rooftops. It is still not clear who gave the final order, probably Prime Minister Wilson himself. A statement from the Home Office said their presence was necessary to maintain law and order. the worst night of terror came late in the afternoon. It started with a police tear gas bombardment in no man's land between the Protestant and Catholic sections of Londonderry. The battlefield, a rock-strewn flat below the Catholic stronghold, which is an eight-story block of low-rent apartments. For several hours, the militant Catholics mounted attacks. Charge. But after sundown, darkness was everybody's enemy. Fires ignited by gas bombs flickered to life. Soon the sky above turned a sickly orange. It is impossible to report who started the fires. The Catholics blame militant Protestants. They in turn accuse roving bands of Catholics. At this location, police fired gunshots at fleeing bombers. In the morning, the first light revealed the destruction. Twelve houses, a post office, two factories, one which left 160 workers without jobs. From Londonderry, Bob Simon reports on some of the street fighting that preceded the arrival of the British troops. This is the Catholic stronghold. The 30-odd people on this roof have been creating more problems for the police below than the hundreds of Catholics massed behind the barricades. An improvised catapult beside the tricolor of the Irish Republic launches everything from bricks and bottles to the familiar firebombs. Every time a policeman is hit, the crowd cheers. The police can do little to retaliate. Many of the guerrillas here are hardly 12 years old. They're having the time of their lives. A few are well into middle age and seem to be acting out of an instinctive bitterness that defies articulation. Several are young and serious and see an important political impulse behind this siege of Londonderry. How do you think it's all going to end? How long is it going to last? 
I hope it lasts a long time. As long as, long as we get a good... Uh, it depends how long it's going to take to get a decent government in here. We want the union aside. We want a liberal government in. And the siege here is going to last until that happens? The siege is going to last until that happens, we hope. It could be years. It could be years, but we'll do it. The Battle of Derry grew more fierce as it went on. It had started with rocks and bricks. Now it was firebombs from the young Catholics in the bog side. The police side, volley after volley of tear gas. <laughs> Operated from behind a barricade in a new apartment section in the bog side of Londonderry. The police made many charges into the rioters. The young firebomb throwers would fall back, then come up again, and the barrage continued. Police offered a truce. If you stay behind your barricade, we'll withdraw. There were no takers. At one point, the riders atop a 10-story apartment broke out an American flag. They hitched it to the trickler of the Irish Republic. Ray Scherer, NBC News in London. There. The rioters appeared very well organized. Some claimed they were getting help from French students in the area, veterans of the May riots in Paris last year. One Catholic command post was set up on a roof of a 10-story apartment building. Here, the gasoline bombs were manufactured, a steady production line, and there appeared to be no shortage of the basic ingredients. They sometimes included nitroglycerin and even soap to make the gasoline stick to whatever it hit. Most of the fighters are young, many in their teens. How old are you, lad? How much? 14. 14. However young, authorities charged the rioters were part of an overall conspiracy of forces seeking to overthrow the government. But not all the bog fighters were passive. There were those who raised the Irish tricolor and were carried on the shoulders of their friends. out of the fighting, but whose faces nevertheless showed how they felt. And finally, there were those who sang a familiar American song of resistance. Here we have the victims of tear gas, some the innocent bystanders of the riots. The obvious suffering of the non-participants contrasts sharply with the cheeky belligerence of the rock throwers. The question is how long the police can last. Very few have had any sleep for almost two days. Over 100 have been injured. The police are the targets for the fire bombers. When one is hit, and is burning, the cheers come from behind the barricades. A few yards away, a house caught fire, a familiar sight in Blockside during the siege. The refugees, mostly women and children, flee looking for a safe place away from the fighting and the burning. But nothing is sadder than the funeral of a child caught in the crossfire of the violence. A machine gun bullet fired by history molded by the hatred and bitterness of 300 years, killed Peter Rooney on Thursday night. He was nine years old. 
Eternal rest grant unto him, O Lord. May he rest in peace. This is Bill Butel, ABC News, Belfast. Douglas Kiker found a handsome and detached British Army officer to describe the tactics of both sides. And the fighting started. The fighting would always start, and then apparently the police always used the same tactics and came straight up Crumlin Road from Belfast itself into the area here, by which time the Protestants had got the message they would pull out and the Catholics would stay there shouting and they'd get a hammering. And this, of course, has created a lot of tension. Then, in the same interview, he turned to a weary clergyman for his interpretation. It is very possible, and in fact it must be done, and in many, many areas of our society it is being done. Reverend, a greater part of this week they spent a lot of time throwing rocks and firebombs yeah. at each other. What went wrong? What goes wrong in any society? What goes wrong in your society? Just fear, prejudice built up over centuries, people reacting because of rumor, because of background. This always goes wrong. It's happening in America, happening in Vietnam, happening in Russia and China. All this happens. It's happening what, here. What happens when the troops leave? That, of course, I don't know. Of course, the TV star of the riots was the youngest member of Parliament capable of pitching bricks with the best of them. Bernadette Devlin. Evident after last night's shootings that the police force cannot be regarded by any seeing individual as being a peacekeeping force. They are a bunch of armed, uniformed hooligans, defenders of the Unionist Party. That's right. That's and right. they are supposed to be the civil forces acting between civilian and civilian. They are the armed wing of the Unionist Party. Until we have established justice in this community, we want the Constitution suspended forth. I must get on the so we return to our four questions. What is the image? Northern Ireland is a battleground where an unresolved religious war between Catholics and Protestants goes on in senseless destruction of life and property. The aggressors are the Catholic young people. The defenders of law and order are the police, patiently enduring repeated attacks of rocks and Molotov cocktails. The victims are caught in the crossfire. The story is told in the language of war over scenes of battle. Is the image accurate? No, it can't be. The complex social, political, and economic analysis needed for a thorough depiction of the riots is not possible. Holding attention in a limited time means action will usually prevail over analysis. As several media critics have pointed out, television is not reality or even the mirror of reality. It creates its own reality. Is the image politically biased? No. Most studies on political bias of TV journalism have concluded that the charges are exaggerated. This coverage showed no particular leaning to the left or to the right, for the Catholics or the Protestants, for the British or for the Irish. Even so, the perceptions were manipulated for other reasons. Is the image slanted? Yes. In a highly competitive endeavor, each network tried to win the largest audience ratings possible by emphasizing the adventure of violence. Reuben Frank, head of NBC News in the late 60s, told his reporters to write their stories as if they were fiction, with structure, conflict, rising action, falling action, with a beginning, a middle, and an end. Furthermore, the story should be relevant to the same themes and topics as domestic news. The Ulster riots were analogies to Chicago, Watts, Detroit, and Washington, D.C. At least, that is what Chet Huntley discovered in his closing statement on August the 15th. Well, by now, it might have occurred to a lot of people that there is a crucial parallel, even a lesson, to be drawn from the fighting in Northern Ireland. It's not just a fight between Protestants and Catholics. It's a fight between a majority of fatly entrenched for hundreds of years and a minority systematically dis discriminated against and persecuted. And the parallel is this. The white Catholics in Ulster are the same as the blacks in the United States. 
They've been deprived of their rights, herded in the slums and denied jobs, hurt and slashed ever since the Battle of the Boyne. And like the blacks, they've revolted. They tried peacefully to get what was coming to them, and then they went into the streets. And like the blacks, they're burning down the very ghettos built to contain them. And like the blacks, they're being shot down. So the lesson apparently is, attention must be paid, as Willie Loman's wife said. The poor and the oppressed and the black of any color must be listened to, or they will surely go into the streets again and again and again and destroy themselves and others. And those in power once more will profess either to see a conspiracy or simply be surprised that it all happened. Good night for NBC News.